Welcome to X-Men oh. Evolution, episode 29 of Cyclops is Waiting for Me, an X-Men nope. animated recap. What? What's that say? Did I say, did I say something? Evolution? Or? <laughs> no, it's JC. <laughs> oh. Just, You're the okay. second episode. Welcome to X-Men Evolution, episode 29 of Cyclops is Waiting for Me, an X-Men animated recap podcast. Rod is so excited for this two-part finale that he decided to jump the gun. This is going to be interesting because I took more detailed notes about this episode. Well, <laughs> because on your text, you said I had part one. Oh, then I fucked it up when I made the it's script. Fine. You know what? At the end of the day, I probably remember equally anyway because I watched this more than an hour ago. Yep, I fucked it up. <laughs> That's all good. This is basically the same episode. Minor spoiler. A- episode 30 is basically the third act of this episode. Got a big fight scene, too. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll just go through the fucking script as I have it it's written. Fine. And you're Rod. Oh, yeah. And I'm Rod. Fuck. <laughs> Uh, let me go back to my old intro. Uh, I do music. You can look me up online. Cyclops is Waiting for Me is our weekly podcast series where we're going back and watching every single X-Men animated episode we can find, along with some bonus episodes. Our first series started with the original 1992 X-Men the animated series, building up to the release of X-Men 97, which we thought was coming to Disney Plus last year. But until that happens, we'll be covering other X-Men animated series like this one, X-Men Evolution. Here's holding out for the anime. <laughs> yeah, we got to get through Wolverine and the X-Men first. I forgive you. I know other friends have said the animes like Iron Man and X-Men animes were kind of boring but i like those slow paced things i only watched one episode but it was like also in the middle of like lockdown and it was like not a good time to watch it for the first time oh yeah but speaking of jennifer hale does the voice of gene gray in wolverine and the x-men Totally neglected to mention that when we went through the voice cast updates for X-Men 97. Oh, nice. That, she's just everywhere. Mortal Kombat, X-Men. She also does Boom Boom in Wolverine and the X-Men, which I didn't even know Boom oh. Boom makes an appearance in that show. Fucking awesome. apparently Boom Boom was the biggest character that I didn't realize was <laughs> an, in any show that I still yeah. love the character. That's awesome. We're a recap show about a series that started over 20 years ago. There are going to be spoilers. If you don't want it spoiled for you, pause the podcast. Not that I know why you keep listening the way today is going. <laughs> Watch the episode and then come back. We are currently not sponsored by or affiliated with Marvel, Marvel Animation, Disney, Disney Plus, or Hulu in any way, shape, or form. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Cyclops IWFM Pod on Instagram, TikTok, Threads, X, and Facebook. And of course, make sure to follow us on all your favorite podcast services. And we recently found out the Google Podcast is going away. So if you listen to us there, scoot on over to YouTube and follow us on YouTube Podcasts. We've heard that it will migrate to YouTube Podcasts. We don't know if the follows will too, like your follow or subscription will as well. Yeah, by the time this airs, that should have happened. So we'll find out. <laughs> On to the show. Today, we're going to talk about Season 2, Episode 16, titled Day of Reckoning, Part 1. It aired on May 11th of 20... Oh, geez. 2002. <laughs> Same day as part two did, they did a double episode day. It currently sits at a 7.9 star rating on IMDb. This is going to be a rocky episode, Rod. You know, I feel like if you've been listening to what is this like our 100 something episode or whatever? It's got to be over 100 because this is 29 of Evolution and we had 72 of yeah of the original plus bonuses you've been listening this long you know the train wreck you're about to <laughs> to enter <laughs> into you know i i wonder i didn't know that they aired on the same day you got to wonder if like oh. the the team that worked on the show was like extra frustrated with that because they had to split it into two episodes and also there's a you know once again minor spoiler there's the previously on or the last time on x-men Yes. On the next episode. Well, okay, we watched that like 10 minutes ago. It's made for syndication is the thing they just probably tell themselves. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's In that's my term. So, kicks off with Wolverine running through the sewers. Reminded me a little bit about Wolverine in the sewers from the Dark Phoenix story underneath the Hellfire Club. I thought that it looked familiar. That's probably why. Yeah, I, I weirdly enough, none of the wikis mentioned it as a reference uh, but it felt like kind of like a little bit of a visual reference for me and i say this a lot on the podcast but especially this entire last two episodes all feel like that they could be a video game script 
and it begins here. I mean, this is also here. like <laughs> some of the most combat heavy stories that we've we've seen in the show. So yeah. too, I what totally you mean, like how the, the missions kind of set the next one off. You know, I don't know there's mm. something about it that has real like PS one game mission vibes <laughs> or X Men arcade mission vibes. There you go, subtle. So. Wolverine gets to a four-way stop, essentially, turns to the right, sees the shadow, starts following. And then we see another great military tool where it's this guy with a helmet who is scanning and is able to confirm just from a scan that Wolverine is a mutant. In my head, I was just like, long-range MRI. That's Everybody has it. So they mention that there's a shadow team who needs to go in there. It's three people. One of them turns on their headset which literally is like a red x-ray. He's able to go through the hallway, see Wolverine on the other side. They casually mentioned Fisher Street. I couldn't find any specific reference to it. I think this show just did a better job of making the world feel fully realized and didn't want to just do, oh, he's going to Main Street and stuff like that. There's some New Yorker that's on the writing staff. It's like, no, that's not how the geography works. He'd be turning left there. (laughs) Right, dude. I think I said this before. I literally did that during Daredevil because they mentioned Hell's Kitchen, but they were close to Rockefeller Center. And I was really pissed about that. They decide to have the stealth pod join. At that point, Wolverine is rounding a corner sniffing. And you see that he almost catches one of these guys. But he's obviously so focused on who he's chasing, and we get the reveal that it's Sabretooth. And this soldier that he almost caught is able to identify that he is chasing another mutant, too. In my head canon, they mentioned that he's so focused on Sabretooth. Otherwise, the whole time, I'm like, he should smell like a dozen soldiers down there, right? (laughs) I don't think that's head canon. I think that's actually what happened. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think you're spot on with that. Yeah, he's then, so focused on the loving musk of Sabretooth. Right. Well, and then speaking of, you know, our ongoing romance between Sabretooth and Wolverine, you know, I was like, shouldn't Sabretooth be able to smell Wolverine? But then we find out. Wolverine is actually able to drop him from behind. He just full on like drop kicks him. Mm-hmm. So it's like, to your point, shouldn't he be able to smell him back? And if he could smell it from miles away, he could smell him in a sewer. Yeah. <laughs> Unless the scent of the sewer is so gross and nasty that Sabretooth can't overcome it. It was a very putrid shade of green that I don't even think the Ninja Turtles had to live in. So this is like extra New Yorky New York water (laughs) in the sewer. Yeah, it was really nasty. At that point, there is a metal grating that drops from above, obviously controlled by Magneto, and just becomes a full-on cage around Wolverine. When that happens, the soldiers get ready to take advantage. They insinuate that they know about Magneto. They don't call him out by name, but they mention the other mutant with those powers, basically. Mm -hmm. And then Wolverine slices his way out. And as he does that, the pod drops in and starts shooting green at Wolverine, which was obviously a very thoughtful choice of what they were shooting. So. Yeah, I, I know. Because I'm just don't... so used to red lasers. I was like, why is it green? Right. Like, I felt it's like, the fuck is this? I thought it was goo at first. And I was like, okay, I think the further the episode gets into using it, it's not. It's maybe some sort of crystal thing or something. But the adult in me is bothered that it never gets explored or explained or explored. As a kid watching a cartoon, it probably doesn't matter. It's, just, yeah. it's a MacGuffin, like, freeze ray, basically. Yeah. So that's when we cut to the animated intro. Like we said, season two, still same animated intro as season one. Comes back, and I think you're right that it is a gel. I think it just hardens quickly. It's like fast-drying resin, essentially. (laughs) Yeah, and did you get a sense when the pod first came out? I thought it was, like, tiny. I thought it was smaller, too. I totally thought that was, like... (laughs) I thought that was like, I don't know, maybe a three foot like diameter or something like that. I did not think that was going to be big enough for a full on person to be able to step out of. Yeah. So Trask walks out of it. Was he ever a doctor before? Was he always that? And I just knew him from the show was not a doctor. I believe he's always been Dr. Boulevard Trask. In the comics, he was an anthropologist. Okay. So like other doctorate. (laughs) He's a military scientist. According to the IMDb stuff with, or not IMDb, with Wikipedia. So yeah, I think he's always been, no, in Ultimate, he was just a government person. You know, they never actually assigned the fact that he was a doctor in 92. So, okay. 
So yeah, it's just interesting for me to hear Dr. Trask. I just I wasn't used to hearing that. But right before we get the reveal of Trask, Sabretooth does climb up and escape. And they basically say, well, let him go. We got the one that we wanted here. <laughs> Which gives me the impression they don't know as much about Sabretooth as they do about Wolverine. We'll talk about this more, like especially in the next episode when everybody kind of collides. I, I was confused almost up to the end about how these stories intertwined because I would go back and forth and thinking like, oh, that these teams are working right. together as distractions, or and then they'd be like, oh no, they don't know each other at all, and then like, are they working together? Like, are these two enemy teams like Trask team and then Magneto's team? I was like, I couldn't figure out if they were in cahoots with each other. Right. Well, they mentioned that there was an informant. For it, and then that that actually doesn't ever get re-explained. I have a theory that the informant is Quicksilver. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't, yeah. I didn't remember hearing that. Yeah, he basically said, "Yeah, our, the the informant gave us good information." So it goes over to the institute. This is not like a time jump. This is in real time. Jean is on Cerebro, and she basically says that she lost track of him. They have lost track of Sabretooth as well. And then Xavier loses his shit. Yeah, my two notes here were, holy CGI, Batman. It was like, I don't know if they've had CG in the show yet. (laughs) I don't think so. But that that shot of them swooping underneath Cerebro to above was just like, we have budget for CG. And the second thing was like, what is wrong with Xavier? I mean, it was the season finale, so. Right? Yeah. (laughs) Then my second note was, what is wrong with Xavier's voice? Which I didn't know I was going to get an answer for later. (laughs) Yeah. That was unexpected. He was more aggressive, definitely, but it sounded like it was a different voice actor. I thought the same thing, too, that it sounded like they had swapped voice actors. Yeah, like they kind of like they did with Gambit, like in 92, you know, like, oh, that's a different guy. Oh, in the last season when it wasn't Chris Potter. Yeah. But yeah, so he starts yelling at her and then Gene is like, I wasn't ready. I've only done this like four times. (laughs) What the fuck, dude? And Xavier instantly pulls back. That was the only part that was a little fuzzy for me. Oh, okay. Well, like on hindsight, yeah, I think what we suspected is true. Or we'll chalk it up to that instead of just being errors. Because Xavier is just so like, he's always been kind of like not a great guy in this show, in this series. But yeah. like, this took a leap, I feel like, the just him being a straight up a-hole. And it was more than just urgency. So we've we've mentioned a little bit in, in past episodes about the Facebook group. That's actually one of the one things from the Facebook group that kind of is a little bit of a reality check is Xavier in the comics has been a massive asshole sometimes. (laughs) So it's not out of character for Xavier. We're just so used to 92 and Patrick Stewart as the two forms of Charles that people know the best that I think we forget that Charles, like as written in other places, kind of a total douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, it basically mentions that something unforeseen happened. We need to figure it out. And then I wrote, mostly naked beast is walking through the sewers. That is the worst person you could have sent in there because he literally isn't wearing any sort of boots or anything like that. And he's walking on his like knuckles like an ape because this is the more like, you know, more gorilla style of beast. And he's putting his hands in that gross ass muck. Oh, yeah, and I forget because it's animated. He's covered in fur. He's basically like a white yeah. dog rolling around in sewage. It's really gross. nasty. Yeah. Uh, versus having, like, say, you know, Storm's down there with them. She can fly at least. Right. And is wearing spandex. Yes. <laughs> they mentioned that they can't find any clues, and then Storm has the brilliant idea. I love how this Storm uses her powers. She makes a small, like, like you know, water spout tornado, sucks up all the water so they could see exactly what the ground looks like where wolverine was and they find the the grate that has been like mangled i like to think that beast who has been wallowing around in the sewage on his hands looks at storm he's like you could have done this all along yeah thanks (laughs) yeah you could have just like moses this thing for like a hot second for me no but the things that stood out they saw how the cuts were and they identified that to wolverine but storm instantly recognizes the way that the metal is twisted resembled magneto i do appreciate how storm had the more intelligent observation of the two and beast is like the doctor or whatever you know the scientist because beast at first i kind of laughed because he's like these cuts are recent and i was like how would you know that yeah i guess i guess what he was getting at was like it wasn't sitting down here for a decade you know it wasn't fully rusted off yeah yeah like you would see the cut would be fresh because their rust hasn't gone over the spot yeah but like 
the way it sounded was like when someone cuts like a tree or flesh or something like oh these yeah. wounds are fresh but it's like okay but then storm's like well more importantly these are unnaturally mangled let's go with that <laughs> yeah and then we see the great you know has the open skylight so to speak which is very dangerous and nobody in bayville seems to give a fuck about this open grate into the sewer because it's just yeah. there on the sidewalk and then there's the weird owl and i already knew what, what that was just yeah. because of how we well and i guess this is following the pace too right because it was about right before the season finale season one that this happened right with mystique revealing or was it earlier with with what Becoming, sorry i just want to make sure into, I, sorry, i'm sh- like turning into like an animal Oh, yeah, yeah. It was the field trip episode, which was the latter part of the season. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw the owl and I was like, they're focusing on this owl too much. And then it flies away and then arrives at the brother at the house. Like, God, it's, they're really leaning into this yep. mystique turning into animals thing. And then when she. It's the morphed. fourth animal she has turned into as well. Yeah. And then when she morphs back into herself, I have questions about the clothes. I mean, I know that we just kind of accept it, but like she was yep. an owl. That was a whole other. like, And. It was just, it was kind of this, like, kind of, it was probably fine at the time, but now that we're used to seeing so many different kinds of morphs, like, now looking back on it, it's kind of horrific, almost like the Animorphs covers, you know? Well, it's a little, it's a little bit like body horror style. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing that stood out to me, even before she had morphed back, is the room is still fucked up from Boom Boom. Yeah, I don't, have, I don't think we saw that before, how fucked up it got, right? <laughs> Well, we saw, we saw when nice. Boom Boom quit, she threw the, you know, out. she left explosives and it blasted out the windows. So yeah. I think it's a safe assumption that it is oh, that in it. worse shape than their bathroom. The whole top floor is just demolished. You follow down to the living room where the Brotherhood kids are hanging out. Blob is distracted when a piece of pizza lands from the ceiling onto his head, which is like that very like teen movie trope scenario. Mm. Also, Blob is bald again, which is a continuity issue from the Scarlet Witch episode. Because he had hair again in the Scarlet Witch episode. Yeah. So that's a continuity. Yeah, and they reference the mall in in this. So it's not like the the episode even got switched or anything. Yeah, that's wild. Well, because it has to be because that was Wanda's debut. So there's no other time where the placement could have happened in it. Mm -hmm. And Mystique goes in there and just like just shreds them for being losers yet again yeah i I had here like mystique gets upset for the boys being high schoolers (laughs) like (laughs) besides being mutants like that's if i walked into a room of high schoolers everything i saw in that scene is what i expect to see like some i think were they playing video games or watching tv or something yeah and blob was like eating pizza and like there was uh quicksilver and blob were they were playing poker with each other okay yeah cards because they probably blew up the TV. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so Mystique begins mentioning Magneto. That gets Wanda's attention, of course. And she mentions that he has abducted Wolverine. So she's not fully looped in as to what's going on with all of Trask people. Is the That's the tip off there. And she starts asking why. Quicksilver is pleading ignorance. He's like, I have no idea. Because he probably is able to tell the truth that magneto didn't kidnap him so he's not lying to her he's just leaving oh, out true, yeah. other contexts most likely yeah this is this is what i was saying i went back and forth on like are they working together or not because like we obviously we saw trask leave with wolverine but then like this whole thing happens and it was like okay so she doesn't mystique doesn't know what's going on so maybe they're not working together and then things just keep syncing up. We'll, we'll keep talking about it. It's interesting. And then Mystique wraps up that shot basically being like, it must be some sort of larger strategy, which she's not wrong about. And mentions that she is forced to make her move. And that's the only reason why I think what we've alluded to of these two episodes, and again, spoiler for the next episode if you didn't watch it yet, that I don't think Mystique has switched with Xavier until this point. Because her being forced oh. to make the move, I think, is when the swap is going to happen. I guess we'll probably get a clear picture of that next season. Right? I think we of, have like, to. When yeah. When it happened. Because the only thing, other thing I could imagine is if, like, she was kind of already playing a long game, you know, because she was already risky for so long. So maybe right. she swapped with Xavier off camera, like, between episodes or right. something just as a preemptive mo- I don't know I mean that's a kind of a long shot or god I hope they don't do this we find out it was like her for 
several episodes or most of the season or something weird like that. <laughs> yeah, as as seen Risty. I mean, it's entirely possible. We we saw Risty as recently as the Walk on the Wild Side episode. Her saying moving up her time frame right here is the is the yeah, the tip off to me that the switch happens. Yeah, yeah. Jump over to the danger room and Rogue and the new mutants are basically all like whacked with paintballs and you know there's just like explosions going on and it looks like basically Rogue and every one of the new mutants except for Multiple and Magma have already been taken out and multiple is just not in this episode at all so yeah and but everybody like else is like, is tagged like wolf spain's not there either i think right so it's like the younger ones aren't there i don't remember seeing. i don't remember if i saw wolf spain there but i know all the others bobby yeah, yeah. included were so yeah you go in and then you see nightcrawler is paired up with magma and they see what's probably a magneto droid or hologram or whatever is set up in there and they are about to get shot And to Professor X's point about, like, these kids aren't ready, Nightcrawler pushes Magma out of the way and ends up getting shot, as opposed to grabbing Magma (laughs) and teleporting away and both of them not being shot. I forget. Did you watch Godzilla Minus One? I did, yes. By the time we we recorded, I have watched it, yeah. Are you making the same connection? Okay, I was like, Now, as soon as you said it, spot the fuck on. Why is that a thing? (laughs) <laughs> there, was, there was a smarter move here. So I don't want to spoil yeah, there, there was a it. There was a move where you had a much better shot. <laughs> but keep this in mind when you if you go watch that movie. Also, highly recommend that movie. It was great. But just like, okay. I guess I don't know how it would be in the moment either. But yeah. It's just funny that these happen. Like, I'm watching this now and then watch Godzilla a few weeks ago. It was like, wow, this is a couple times in different pieces of media. So Magma lands next to the other surviving group, so to speak, <laughs> with Spike, Gene, Cyclops, and Kitty. There's another close call. Cyclops is able to blast down one of the drones, but is essentially just regrouping. And Xavier is like screaming at him to make a move. And yeah, it's basically he's... like, if you're not going to do this, then fucking give Gene control. Yeah, because he's like, on the field, you know, you won't you won't get time or whatever. And it's like, well, the teenagers and they're in the training. I mean, he's 17. He's ready to get shipped off to the military. Come on. Right. So they decide they're going to rush. As they rush, they surround him. Spike accidentally kicks a rock down. That rock lands into the Magneto statue, which you just realized was an explosive trap. Yeah, he just knocks the helmet off. And I was like, what the like most anticlimactic way to lose that whole training sequence? Right. And there's a bunch of like slow mo escapes of people just getting out of the, you know, the blast radius. But then a bunch of drones come by and just tag everybody. Yeah, it would have been a massacre if it wasn't paintballs. And then Xavier is pissed. Yeah, he tells everybody to get into the planning room for good old scolding. Cyclops is like, well, you've never pushed us so hard before, asking to get a little bit of slack for it. And Xavier is basically like, no, 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 I had to fucking do this. I had to confirm my fears that you guys are not ready for Magneto. And then, you know, Cyclops just kind of like keeps pushing and Xavier just throws right back at him like, yeah, sorry, dude, you couldn't even take care of the Brotherhood. How are you going to take care of Magneto? Like, he just goes for yeah. Cyclops' throat. Not wrong, but maybe not the right thing to say at the moment. <laughs> no. And then Xavier has, you know, just the, well, I knew this was going to go so bad that I already have your backup ready. And he says, we're going to bolster the ranks, welcome your new teammates. And I thought there were going to be, like, debuts of other mutants we didn't know about. And then it's just straight up the Brotherhood coming out of the open door. Yeah, and this is right before like the commercial break. So it's Yeah, this was a cut to commercial. I could just imagine as kids is this is like the soap opera like she's still alive like moment, you know? (laughs) Like what? Yeah. I mean it's like you also gotta wonder like what's going on in the heads of the X Men. They're like they they literally tried to kill us and you're letting them all in here right now. Yeah. Yeah, they've broken in here. We just had a scuffle at the mall. Like the mall got leveled because they like had a fight there. And again, I think it's Xavier is kind of a dick. So the X Men start to protest. Quicksilver is just like kind of cool, cocky asshole about this, where he's like, "Yeah, we won. You lost. Get over it." And it kind of plays plays into his like whole like ladies' man vibe. This kind of stuff just happens for me. And then you know, Xavier's like, "You're going to be up against tremendous odds. You're just going to be a stronger team if you have some help." Mm-hmm. Or Xavier, maybe let's not you know enlist teenagers. <laughs> 
exclusively right. teenagers. <laughs> yeah, May- maybe find more wolverines and storms and beasts rather than the kids. Yeah. They ask why the why would the brotherhood even join them and the brotherhood won't say why. Yeah, well, I think Pietro that's when he says like we got our reasons. Yeah. And, and then I think Lance even steps up and says that they need a new leader and he kind of implies that he should like take over for Cyclops. Which we've seen that rivalry going back to the mountain training thing in season one. Yeah. And then aside from saying the exact phrase of I quit, Cyclops quits. Yeah. <laughs> he like he just out. wouldn't say the exact words of I quit. Like, but everything else was there. And then Gene is like ready to try to stop him. And Xavier's like, no, no, it's, 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 it's fuck him. He's, he's going to leave. We need you on Cerebro. And this was all more like weirdness with Xavier because we saw like a level of assholery from him and then this episode just like skipped a few steps <laughs> right jumps over we have the security truck that's driving through the cities into a warehouse district has wolverine wolverine even though he is in leg and handcuffs he almost is able to murder these these guys who are the security guards and you see that trask is there and is able to like take him down with a shock collar scenario they need to mobilize that green goose stuff so it's just like i know it probably wears off whatever they just need to have in the truck where they just keep like re-upping it every so often yeah let's just keep (laughs) it's like spider-man's web it's like it dissolves after an hour so it's like cool if you have a 90 minute drive just keep shooting him (laughs) right there's the quote of the week just keep shooting him he's like if you have a 90 minute drive just keep shooting him (laughs) won't get taken out of context or anything the way you edit rod thanks (laughs) actually it that would be even that would work in a more violent sense in like a Logan movie or something. Like they wouldn't goo him. They're like, just keep shooting him in the head, man. I think that has <laughs> happened in in yeah. no lie, two Some dozen point. different stories. So for you not being a comic book reader, you yeah. nailed some of the more violent oh, nice. Wolverine shit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, they just have to keep trying to kill him. So he has to like... Uh, yeah, you just basically force him to keep regenerating. And one of the other things that I thought was interesting from some of the discussion boards that I've been in with this, people are like, wow, they really nerfed Wolverine's healing power. And it's like, no, the healing power in the 90s into 2000 was a lot weaker. It really wasn't until like the movies and stuff where he was like able to regenerate at the speed that he did and then that kind of like you know it's it's what we've talked about powers just continue to escalate over time you know superman never used to be able to fly he was just jumping really high so i forgot about that i think even stan lee had mentioned like his in his head thor wasn't so much flying as that he would swing milnor so hard that he when he would hold it it would just like take him with it yeah (laughs) <laughs> and that's how it was originally drawn too. Yeah, oh, really. <laughs> it was. He, that's why it had the wrist strap on it. Oh, okay. They start having like the little bit of villain exposition. Wolverine looks and is like, "This kind of resembles Shield." Which, thank goodness, we had the Operation Rebirth episode, so we understand Wolverine's connection to Shield. Otherwise, out of context, that would have been a random thing to hear. Yeah, Imagine would, hearing that if you had missed Operation Rebirth when this originally aired and wasn't in reruns yet. Right. You would have been like losing your like, mind about S.H.I.E.L.D. at that point. I was also kind of like, are, are they going to have some weird Trask connection with S.H.I.E.L.D.? They kind of do, but not in the way I thought. I was like, wait, are they actually going to a S.H.I.E.L.D. bunker right now? Like, what's going on? Right. And Trask revealed that he is not S.H.I.E.L.D., not anymore, because he severed a connection from being there in the past. It's still, for me at least, wild to think about. Like, I don't know if there's a history of Trask and S.H.I.E.L.D. and stuff, but, like, that kind of makes sense in this world, that there's, like, maybe there's only, like, one government organization that has all this, like, crazy advanced technology, so there's not, like, you know, 20 of them running around with all this crazy tech. So if he, he, like, basically steals methods and technology and brings it with him to whatever he's calling this. Looking through very, very quickly, at least in the Ultimate version... And then in the main comics, he is not a part of S.H.I.E.L.D. I think that might be a specific thing for Evolution. Yeah, which is a great tie-in. Like I said, it just kind of limits like the loose ends of who has all this crazy tech and power and stuff. Right. And then we get the first time it's really been said in Evolution, the mutants are a threat, mutants are a menace, we don't want them poisoning the gene pool. Lots of very specific very pointed phrasing at that time which shows that leap of like oh they're the people who think that these are like monsters and sasquatch in the wood to like 
nope this is this is where it goes into a full-on bigotry scenario yeah yeah i think he even says something about like protecting like humankind or like our our own kind or whatever because there's like the mutants are a threat wolverine is like you know not all of us are the bad guys we're not all the same and trust is basically like yeah but we still get caught in the crossfire which he's not wrong about that i mean they've They've kind of shown that already, you know, with the mall and stuff. Right. They've yet to have innocent people caught in the crossfire. There's only been, like, damage done and stuff like that mm. up until this episode. Yeah. Ex- except for the psych ward. <laughs> and, okay, and the school when almost yeah. everybody died. <laughs> anyway, but that is where we get the full-on hint of the Sentinel because there's a conveyor belt. And one of the things is crystal clearly a giant, like, forearm to hand. So I missed that totally. Back at the mansion, Cerebro is giving Gene some information. And to your point, maybe they have already done the switch at this because it's Gene who's using Cerebro and not Charles, mentioning that Wolverine's healing powers have been spotted. I like that they specify this because we even had a little bit of that conversation with Angel. Like, how do they know when Angel's using his powers? Because it's not like he's sprouting the wings out of nowhere. Mm. So. Oh, yeah. So. There, yeah, there has to be some like active thing happening. So if like Wolverine's regenerating, so I guess right, we'll, that's Angel, triggering the X gene scenario. And Angel, it's like maybe if he's shooting the things out of his wings, maybe I don't know something that requires like that effort. Yeah, he, but know. he wasn't he wasn't shooting anything. He was yeah, yeah. Mol- he was molting. There you go. That that's his mutant powers molting. <laughs> it's the worst mutant power <laughs> ever. That'd be the kind of power I would end up getting in this world. Rod, I don't say this in an offensive way. If you got a mutant power, you would literally be Beak. Did I see Beak? That sounds familiar. In the comics, Beak is the one who marries Angel, the same Angel that we had in X-Men First Class. That's why it sounds familiar. I've been re-watching some breakdowns yeah. of the X-Men movies in preparation for whenever the mutants get introduced to the MCU. And I don't want to watch those movies again, at least, I guess, outside this podcast. And <laughs> I was going to so say, we're, we're going to do them here eventually. Yeah. So I don't want to watch them in my free time. We'll put it that way. <laughs> Just there we my go. Own leisure. So I was rewatching some of these breakdowns and that beat comes up in that because I think was he, he was either mentioned or in first class or something. I don't remember exactly. It's been so long since I watched first class. I just know yeah. in the comics, mm-hmm. Beak is notoriously like has the least effective powers of any mutant ever. And yeah. effectively, he just looks a little bit like a chicken. I feel like it would either be that or I would be like Sam Jackson in Unbreakable. <laughs> that you're just basically made of glass. Yeah, my superpower is that I break easy. That would fit. <laughs> We're not going to call that a superpower. We're just going to call that a mutation. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nope. So you see Beast and Kitty are with the Brotherhood in their jet. You notice that Mystique is initiating DEFCON 4, which starts a countdown. And then you have the remaining X-Men in the copter. And this is where I wasn't sure when the switch happened, because that means Mystique got there really, really quick to get in the thing as Xavier. And I I think to your point, we're going to have like that Ocean's Eleven moment in the premiere of the next season that's going to show how the swap happened yeah like i mean i guess i could see depending on time worked here like maybe the kids are like getting ready and then she yeah. sneaks off to do the defcon 4 thing but then the alarm goes i don't know yeah because it's or maybe it's another continuity error thing and someone just didn't think about it right storm is like well what about cyclops and xavier's like nope fuck him he's a liability storm protests a little bit further I think she's kind of like given the impression, especially because they're in the Velocity, which is the X copter's name. I didn't know that. Okay. And the only reason I know it is because as she's protesting and basically being like, it's probably not a good idea to leave without him because they kind of trust him a lot. Xavier just ignores it and starts talking about the copter as the Velocity. Yeah. And he's like, nope, cool. Fuck it. We're taking off and just completely <laughs> ignores her protest. And I don't know. I was assuming that Magma wasn't supposed to go, but she runs after it like she was supposed to be in there. Yeah, I was a little confused, like, because everybody just got the, like, the riot act read to them of, yeah, you guys suck and you're not ready for this. So why would she have been shocked that she didn't get to go along? Maybe in her head that she was a little bit further advanced because she was training with Jean or something. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, there's maybe just... there's, yeah, because she was one of the baby little sirens. So she's actually oh, that's right. fought crime and stuff, unlike the other ones. 
Yeah, or she's just like the divergent or whatever. Like she was told she can't go, but she knows she's ready. Because we try, we see her try right. to sneak out later. So at that point, lockdown starts hitting as the jet and the velocity have both taken off. And Bobby is like, wait, what's going on? He realizes something is wrong. Sam is fucking clueless. I think Sam needs to be on some sort of med- medication or something <laughs> like that. And doors start closing. So Magma realizes this. She runs and is able to dive out the front just before it happens. And Sam concusses himself. I was wondering about that. Like, I know that, you know, Cannonball, obviously. I was like, can he do the same thing Rogue does with metal doors? I think his whole thing (laughs) is what he's able to do is while he's still moving at that speed, he doesn't get hurt. Mm -hmm. But if he stops, that's when he could be hurt again. So... Like, in my mind, he's just literally causing brain trauma every time he's charging that that door. (laughs) Right around then, Boom Boom has decided this is going to be the good time to drive up to visit the mansion. She sees magma as the defenses start to shoot all around, and then we get another break to commercial. So this has to be pretty quickly after the mall fight, because Boom Boom did what? Stole Lance's Jeep and drove around for a few days? Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah, when she got kicked out. Come back from commercial, Boom Boom drives in, saves Magma. Nobody's shocked by that. That's, you know, <laughs> it, we're not going to kill these kids. It's it's one thing to kill Morph. We're not going to kill teenagers. And this show is Spe- like a little Specifically more... in the cartoon. In the comic book, we would absolutely kill teenagers. This show, everything's more of like high school stakes than, you know, they were in 92. Right. Like, it seems like the worst thing that could happen. Like, a building will still collapse. No one will perish. But, like, Lance and Kitty might break up, you know? Like, that's the consequence. <laughs> Meanwhile, to date the day that we recorded this episode, the comic came out today called Dead X-Men, which uh, is, I believe, I haven't even opened it yet. I just picked it up at my store, Golden Apple. It is the X-Men who were killed in the attack on Krakoa during the Hellfire Gala. And it's literally, uh, like, Jubilee and Dazzler coming out of graves is the cover of this issue. So, oh, no. oh like zombies? Also, I'll, I'll, I'll post it later. Scott is sitting awkwardly in his car at Makeout Point. I had the exact same note. And then Boom Boom and Magma have apparently been driving around for a second, trying to figure out where he is. Since Magma obviously knew that he had left and didn't go with the crew that was going on this mission. And Scott is like, wait, what do you mean DEFCON 4? Like, he knows something is up for that to to take place. And then Boom Boom is starting to say that she was like, yeah, I was coming to tell Xavier about Mystique again, like four days after her encounter with Mystique had happened. Let's say 48 hours minimum. That's that's how my timetable is on that. And then mentions that Mystique was the reason for the mall attack. And then Cyclops really starts putting two and two together on stuff. He's like, yeah, someone set off DEFCON 4. And then I guess she's just like, fuck Slance's Jeep. Like, leaves it. Yeah, just, I mean, it's not (laughs) hers. She doesn't give a shit. We jump over. Wolverine steps out of what is essentially a holding cell into the middle of what looks like an arena, like kind of like a industrial like center, almost like where you would see like a superhero fight club is kind of the vibe I got from it visually. And Trask mentions that he needs them for research and basically forces them to step out into the middle of it and introduces the guardian of the human race. And that's where we start to see this show's version of a sentinel. This might have been the most excited I've gotten so far in Evolution. I didn't realize how much I love the Sentinels. Really? I haven't seen him in a while. It's weird. It's kind of like people who like Homelander. Like, you shouldn't like him. You shouldn't like the Sentinels, you know, because they don't represent the good thing. But they're just so cool. And maybe it's because I love Transformers and dinosaurs. So, like, it's basically like X-Men's Transformers, right? Especially this one. Like, nothing will replace the 92 series Sentinels to me. To me, that's like the standard base Sentinel. Right. This one is not quite as cool to me, but really cool because of how much it, like, transforms. The the Sentinels in 92 were just, like, monolithic robots, which is kind of ironic because they call it a mono... They call the Sentinels monoliths monolithic in this show. Right. And they're not really... I mean, not neither of them are, but at least the Sentinels in 92, they they didn't really change. They, like, flew and blasted things, but the, the evolution Sentinels, like, would change forms, expand, contract, like... Yeah, I, it's, I think it's really cool. 
In 92, the only one that does that is Nimrod because he's essentially the super sentinel from the future. But to your point, they're almost like that classic Japanese animation, like giant robots. Like, I can't think of the names of, of the series, but they're the ones that's just like very cylindrical legs and arms that don't really bend and stuff like that. Like, the articulation is hyper limited, whereas this felt a little bit, and I don't want to insult it by saying it, kind of reminiscent of what you would see from the infrastructure of Michael Bay's Transformers. Like, there's lots of pieces all over the fucking place. And actually, that's another thing. You know, stories of those movies aside, I really like the Michael Bay Transformers action and visuals and stuff. Like, I have good memories of the the action part of it and stuff. Like, I rewatched them recently, and the stories don't hold up. I mean, they didn't a lot then but especially now but the the visuals and the action was like so cool and maybe that's why i like this sentinel so much because it was actually that was the same a few years of each other right like the trans michael bay transformers movies come out a few years after this 2005 six Five-ish, era yeah. ish so this is, yeah so this is probably there's some some like stylistic thing was probably happening that like informed both of these designs right so it starts attacking wolverine he's dodging you get close on a few hits, but they have, because this is kind of like an industrial basement arena thing, Wolverine slices through part of a crane that lands on the Sentinel's head. So he's like slashing through it. He's like crawling around it, kind of what we've seen Wolverine do in in other versions of the character, where he's slashing at various weak points and stuff like that, both on the chest, then on the back, and then it's able to grab him and then it just opens up and just reveals tons more guns under like the initial armor plating to your point of like the transformation yeah. that was so cool i i would have lo- i they probably i don't know if they made a toy of these these sentinels but i would have loved for them to make a toy of this sentinel but also like do the things it does in this show you know like where it actually like kind of move and like expand and have like little launchers and things as a kid i would have loved that because that's the kind of shit like oh man that's so cool i don't know why there's something about like machinery moving and transforming and stuff that's really cool hate to be the bearer of of bad news there is not a x-men evolution version of the sentinel toy i assume there wasn't because i feel like even though i have wasn't watching the show at the time i feel like action figures were still like you would still know if they were around and stuff you know big toy lines and things (laughs) But right, because there were X Men Evolution toys, but mm-hmm. not this version of a Sentinel. Real quick, going back to the crane a little bit, I thought it was kind of a funny, like, meta callback to just our podcast a little bit because you had mentioned back in the Operation Rebirth episode that the long range MRI was so much jumping the shark that you were expecting, like, a giant magnet to, like, come down out of the helicopter to pick Wolverine up. I don't know if you thought this, but when they showed the crane, I thought that was a giant magnet at the the top of the crane. That's what he was going to drop that magnet onto the Sentinel, and that was going to be, like, the move. Because it was, like, this big metal platform or something, like, sheet. Yeah, yeah. And I was was like, is he going to fulfill John's prophecy and drop a giant magnet? (laughs) John's prophecy that is 22 years late <laughs> yeah yeah not for us it's still it's still giving a prophecy about a thing yeah. from the past wolverine starts to climb his way out but eventually so many rockets get shot that it knocks wolverine down to the bottom again and then at first i was like cyclops is driving by those new york mythical beach cliffs because i <laughs> thought it was like the same spot where everybody got abducted in season one you find out that he's actually driven to the cliffs that are by the waterfall that is where the jet takes out of yeah behind the mansion right Probably a geographical problem <laughs> yeah there's something about that layout that i'm just like that doesn't that's not new york like where but it's the same problem in every version of this show it's not like mm-hmm. only evolution has done this weird yeah yeah so back inside sam keeps trying to kill himself i mean concussing himself but then the house has had enough of it and decides it's gonna start shooting at them yeah, because it goes into demolition mode. Right. The defenses start to to pop up. The DEFCON switches to self-destruct countdown. Which another, I, guess, I guess that's something that was pre-programmed by Mystique. Because otherwise I'm like, oh, wait, that, that just that escalated very quickly. <laughs> with the, right. You know. I got that, that there was some sort of timer that it went into DEFCON for a time frame. 
And maybe it was a, like, if we're in DEF CON for a certain amount of time and somebody doesn't turn it off, we have to, like, self-destruct to protect our secrets kind of scenario. Oh, that could make sense. I, yep. I would like to think that it was just sensing Sam, like, repeatedly trying to blow through the blast doors. And it's like, well, you got to shut this shit down. We jump over. We're in New York. We could tell by all the bridges and stuff like that. And the waterfall. And they are at Pier 58. There is... A historical Pier 58 on the North River, but I could not find it with any significance to the to the X-Men. It was just, this was property of the White Star line. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. that's not helpful at all for this. <laughs> but the five Magneto bubbles come down. And then I'll let you talk about this because I had this spoiled for me when oh, I was okay. looking at our upcoming guests. I loved how this show treats magneto's orbs like old school american idol treated that gospel choir for the finales it's like they only come to the finale you know like whoever is like the winner would go out yep. and sing and then this choir who was in a closet somewhere would just like come on out and stuff and so here is like we haven't seen these orbs at all including magneto episodes i don't think at least and they come nope, on down, we have so we know. have literally not seen it since the finale of season one yeah so you know it means business admittedly this was a really cool reveal. It was very like gangster and like cinematic and movie like. So like Sabretooth comes out first. That's not at, and they did this in the right order. I feel like too because Sabretooth comes out first. We kind of expected him because we saw him earlier, and yep. then Gambit appears. Not in love with Gambit's design in this show. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's like the goatee's drawn weird for me or whatever. I wrote that it's scumbag Gambit. The yeah, it kind of the goatee. I think makes me want to punch him even more. Yeah, and it's in combination with the way his hair is drawn. Well, it wasn't just the the shitty, like, pseudo bowl cut hair. It looked a little bit like the kid from Stranger Things, his hair. Oh, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he also has the soul patch above the <laughs> shitty goatee, too. So it's like the <laughs> I, most punchable version of Gambit, and that says a lot. I forgot about the soul patch. Oh, 2000 something something. That's great. Yeah, but he's exciting to see Gambit. I think he was charging a card. That was like one of our first like kind of glimpses into it. And he was Pyro- he was doing the folding thing where he was like one handed oh, shu- or not folding, uh, shuffling, one handed yeah. shuffling. So and then Pyro. Well, that was kind of unexpected because like he doesn't really have a role after this. I mean, a little bit, but like, I don't know. Is weird. He was kind of like a you know whatever he think, he's good for an impressive visual like you got to yeah. give it to this version of pyro because he's literally making a monster out of the fire so yeah. it's great from a visual perspective yeah he was the he was the the razzle dazzle for the, yep. <laughs> the villain team and then colossus which i only recognize because there's only like few dudes that big with that haircut i didn't think about this you have to make a creative decision when you're animating of like how to morph someone like that you know yeah, do you so they, either just have the flash that they turn into it or this one where it was like it almost looked like metal was like expanding out like a piece at a time. Yeah, it was like plates kind of. Do you remember how the Silverhawks would sometimes transform yes, and stuff like that? Yes, that's spot on. Yep. <laughs> then the big orb was left open dramatically longer. And of course, it's Magneto. But this was such like a cool, you know, it was almost like a Rat Pack kind of reveal vibe. Yeah. Or, or whatever. And so I kind of, I do remember you mentioning like Gambit was going to be coming up later, but not as significant as a role as we thought. Doesn't even say a word the entire episode. I didn't even think about that. None Gambit of part. Magneto's acolytes, and that's what they're referred to on all the wikis. So I'm sure at some point we formally hear this name for them, but not a single one of them says anything in the episode. The scene that I think he does is probably just inferred by yep. Moans things okay yeah interesting but yeah it's, nope. it's, it's a cool cool setup and they're they're basically there to bring in the third act action right so episode wraps up with wolverine getting picked up by the sentinel and we see it has the you know notification in its headset to terminate him and it's holding basically like his lifeless body even though we know he's not dead in his hand and that actually reminded me of the visual to like you know bookend the episode the cover of uncanny x-men number 142 which rod that was one of your christmas gifts where it's the sentinel i was gonna i was gonna grab it and realize we're not recording the video (laughs) where wolverine is getting blasted by the sentinel in days of future past Oh, yeah. Wow. It literally looks like what it must have looked like right before the Sentinel blasted him. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. And once again, it's another one of those fake 
cliffhangers. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. You can, He's the closest you could get away with trying to kill because we know he's got regenerative abilities, even if it's not as fast and powerful and as hardcore as the modern comic iteration is, where he could basically come back from, you know, blood sample and enough energy, which is a bit ridiculous, but whatever. Yeah. He's the one that you could, like, stop his heart and still bring him back, so... Man, that would be great is if we could get, I think it's Warner Brother Animations Studios, like style animation, you know, like they do the Mortal Kombat animated films and things, that level of violence. You just see the Sentinel like squish him <laughs> and it's like bursts like blood and guts and then he just forms. I, I have some Deadpool comics I can lend you, Rod, that <laughs> cover this exact concept. Oh, really? Okay. That oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, It'll they, probably happen in Deadpool 3. I would be shocked if it doesn't. Yeah. And maybe we'll get him like totally tripping and then it's a cartoon version of it happening. Oh, man, that yeah, that'd be cool to have some. Oh wow, is that that would be hilarious if that's the way they tie in ninety seven? Is there some like multiverse hallucinating scene? There, and Deadpool you have Deadpool in. from ninety two who never said a word in ninety two, voiced yeah. by Ryan Reynolds interacting with the group. Something, yeah. Oh man, saying. we just totally made a moment that we are going to be so let down when it right. doesn't happen. And that's how we wrap up the episode because we get a to be continued, which at the time of broadcast, as long as you know WB kids didn't you know decide that's when they were going to start Saturday afternoon college basketball or something like that. That's when you know they're going to go right into it. But you will get that next week from us. Final thoughts, Rod? I loved seeing the Sentinels. I loved seeing the like the villain reveal at the end and you know in a rare occasion there actually felt like there were stakes in yeah. in this episode that were like elevated from like high school drama yeah it felt like this episode left the high school drama behind yeah yeah they're gonna no. die in this one if they if they don't make the right choice which yep. xavier yells several times yeah he's really like oh yeah you're all gonna fucking die so thank you guys for joining us. If you have any thoughts, make sure to drop them into the comments for either the YouTube upload, the official Instagram about this post, or we also have like a comment thing that is available on Spotify too. Thank you guys who have been using that and voting in the polls. If you like what you heard, we appreciate a rating on the podcast app of your choosing. You can find us at Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Spotify, YouTube Podcasts, and Rod's all-time favorite cast box. I definitely have to fucking reset this computer. 